I love Easter week. Um, so tonight, we're going to continue through First John, though, before we pray. And um, just we're just going to get through uh, three verses tonight. I started studying for this and thought we'd get through about a half a chapter and only got through three verses and then cross-referenced a bunch of different stories and got caught up on an Old Testament story that I think is applicable. So I thought we would start there tonight. So let's pray. And then we will jump into this. Also, I'm supposed to say hello to those watching online. Um, this is for you, Jim Womack, and those who have asked for us to live stream. Uh, let's pray tonight. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for people who will come out on a Tuesday night to pray, to seek you, uh, to hear what you have to say, to study your word in deeper ways, and to pray for our church and for our city. Pray tonight that as we open your word and continue through First John, that you would speak to us uh, and to each of us, let each of us have ears to hear exactly what you need to say to us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Okay, so if you've got your Bible, head over to 1 John chapter 1. And we are going to look at verse, start in verse 5 when you get there. I like hearing pages. I feel like in our technologically advanced world, I've been using a Bible more than an iPhone, and I think it's cool. <laughs> Still got your phone. It's okay. <laughs> All right, First John 1, 5. It says, this is the message we have heard from him and declared to you. God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. We're going to stop right there, because in those three verses, there's a whole lot to unpack. And so I'm just going to dive in here. Um, we're going to turn around a bunch of scripture tonight. We're going to look at a lot of stuff. Um, so get your Bible ready to flip. But right at the beginning, what we talked about last week when you're looking at a passage of scripture especially is the three questions that we learned all through last year, if you were part of our leadership service, that we, look, we ask when we look at a uh, passage, and that's what is the context, what is the writer's intent, and then how do I apply it to my life? Um, and when you look at the context of 1 John as a whole, we kind of talked about that last week, uh, John is writing here to everyone, uh, basically not everyone, I mean, okay, let me rephrase that. John is writing to all of us, but the intent of this book and his context of who he's writing to was to the early church because he had heard about the early church and he had heard what they were doing and he had heard about the light of Christ coming alive in them, but he'd also heard about them uh, dabbling and playing with darkness. And so he's writing this to them because he wants to make the truth of Christ known to them. And so that's kind of the context of it. And the intent, I think, of this these three verses we're looking at tonight is that he wants to encourage us as followers of Christ to walk in the light of Christ, which sounds really easy until you actually dig into it. As you're reading through verse 5, he says, this is the message we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him there's no darkness at all. This has been a plight of humanity for all time. We experience the light, but we tend to pull ourselves back towards the darkness. Light was made to draw, to draw, or sorry, to drawn out, drow, drawn, drown out darkness, and not the other way around. John is seeing that as people have experienced the light of Christ, they are trying to stay in darkness part way, but their light is not shining in darkness. Instead, the darkness is overtaking it. And so we've looked at James. Uh, chapter 1 a lot. I love James. I reference it a lot because it's one of my favorite books. But if you look at James chapter 1, in fact, you want to turn over there to James 1 and look uh, at verse 13, there's a pattern that James talks about that we go through when we talk about sin. Now, it's Tuesday night and there's not a lot of us here. And that's pretty normal midweek in church, right? But here's the deal. We don't talk a lot about sin in church and I don't particularly talk a lot about sin as a pastor because a lot of times we talk about sin and immediately people think, oh, you're just being con condescending or you're condemning or you're trying to tell us that we don't have grace. None of that is true. But the truth is that we do, if we're going to follow Christ, there is right and there is wrong. 
And so we need to know what is right and what is wrong. It doesn't mean that we need to have a hammer and that God's up in heaven waiting to bash us over the head, right, and tell us that he's going to kill us for our sin because that's the whole point that Christ came into the world was to die and take our punishment for our sin. But even after he came into the world, because John is writing here to the early church, so Jesus has already come into the world, And he's realizing, hey, even though you already know he took the punishment on you, here's still some things that I see this progression of what you're doing in your life. So if you go over to James chapter 1, in James 1.13 it says, when tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. So if you watch this pattern of what happens with sin, I don't even like writing this on this board. Can I be real? Here's the pattern of sin according to James. And I'm referencing this back because I want to take you to the story in the Old Testament. So the first thing that happens is we're tempted. Hemp. I don't know how you spell that. Is that right? Sure. Okay. So he says, when tempted, no one should say God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when, by his own evil desire, he's dragged away and enticed. And then after desire has been conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death. So you see this pattern that James lays out for us, and I've said before, I think that if you only could take one book of the Bible and say, I have to live my entire life based on only one book in the Bible, like, you wouldn't probably choose the book of Habakkuk, right? I mean, you'd be depressed a lot, and then you'd have joy at the very end. But, like, you know, you wouldn't choose the book of Job because you'd be, ugh. You're like, you, you, you could choose Psalms, but you'd be singing all the time, and it'd just be wonderful. But if you had to pick one book, I would pick James because the entire Christian life can be summed up in James. And I love right in chapter 1, he goes right into sin and says, look, here's what happens is we're tempted, and then once we're tempted, we have the desire to do what is wrong. And then once we have the desire, if we give into it, it leads to sin. And ultimately sin, when it, when it grows up, so at the beginning you're just dabbling, it's okay, it's not a big deal. But when it grows up, it leads to death. So turn over in your Bible. I want to look at a story about sin in the Old Testament context to 2 Samuel chapter 11. And when I was studying this today, I thought, you know what, like, I was just trying to go over and be like, what would be something an Old Testament story. I love cross-referencing to the Old Testament because there's so much beauty in the Old Testament. Um, And I love looking at Old Testament prophets and kings. And this is a story about David and um, kind of the pattern of his life. And so we're going to read all of chapter 11. So we'll just go in here, all right? I told you on Tuesdays we're going to fill you up with scripture. So here we go. In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Reba. Reba, sorry. But David remained in Jerusalem. (laughs) One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful, and David sent someone to find out about her. What you see right here in the very first part of 2 Samuel chapter 11 is that David is the king, and it says in the very first one, in the very first verse, that in the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out. Which you can read right over. But what's interesting to me about 2 Samuel chapter 11, we're talking about light and darkness, we're talking about temptation and desire and sin and death, is that David, as a man after God's own heart, as the king of Israel, as the man who'd been anointed by Samuel, as the, as the one to lead God's people, was at a point where he was supposed to be leading, and instead he sent someone in his place because he didn't feel like going, I guess. I don't know, it doesn't say why he didn't go, but it says he sent Joab out when he should have been out fighting at the front lines. And this is a huge, huge, I would say, caution to those of us that are leaders, is it's very easy sometimes for us to take a back seat and say, okay, let's push someone else forward and I'll just stay back here and chill, right? Like chill sounds great to me sometimes. And I find that in my own life where I don't wanna step in to how I'm, called to lead because I feel like, well, people might think that I'm trying to be a bully or people might think I'm trying to say what I want. And it's, like, and it's not. It's that when God puts something on you and says, I've ordained you for this thing, he ordained David for that. 
And so when David tries to push someone else out there, he's not doing God any justice and he's not doing his people any justice. And so instead, instead he sends Joab out and remains at home. And so what happens when you remain at home? This is my own personal like soapbox when I talk to people all the time. I truly believe that temptation and desire in sin comes out of boredom. I think sometimes, I'm not saying always, obviously there's lots of things that lead to sin, but if I look at my own life and the times that I'm tempted and it leads to desire and I find myself in sin, it typically is a time when I have stepped out of my calling and I don't mean like in life. I mean like I take a break from it and I say, you know what, right now I'm just going to turn, I'm going to turn it off, right? Rest is good. It's good to rest. It's good to have a Sabbath. It's good to stop. But sometimes we get bored and we're like, well, I don't really know what to do, so I think I'll just sit here and think. Not that it's wrong to have times to sit and think, right? But the more we find ourselves bored and we find ourselves, I don't really know what I want to do and I don't really know what my purpose is anymore and I don't really know... That is when sin starts creeping in and you get, oh, well, I guess I could go watch this lady bathe. I mean, we don't, I don't know if on the roof of my house I can't see women bathing, but just, you know. All right, so David sent someone to find out about her. We're in verse 3. And the man said, isn't this Bathsheba, the daughter of Elam and the wife of Uriah the Hittites? Then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him, and he slept with her. So what happens? David doesn't go off. He's in boredom. He stays at, where he, at his palace where it feels safe and not out fighting where he's supposed to be as a warrior and as the king, and he's tempted. And he lets his temptation in verse three or, or in verse 2 lead to desire, and he's like, hey, I think I, I want that woman. I think I, I, I like this beautiful woman down here bathing. And so what does he do? He sends someone to go. The guy can't even go get her himself, which is crazy, right? He can't, like, if you're going to mess up, at least mess up yourself. Don't ask your friend to go do it for you, but he's going to mess up. And so he sends someone to go get her, and by verse 4, he's already sleeping with her. Now, the whole context, I know it's Old Testament and there's a lot of, you know, cross, uh, I don't know what the word is, there's a lot of marriage going on. You know, they had a lot of wives and there's all this thing. But this was clearly someone that David knew was not for himself. But because he let temptation lead to desire, by verse 4, the desire had already led to sin. Look at verse 5. The woman conceived and sent word to David saying, I am pregnant. So David sent his word to Joab, send, to your, or, I'm sorry, send me to Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent him to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked, how is, how, asked him how Joab uh, was, man, how the soldiers were and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. So Uriah left the palace and a gift from the king was sent after him. But Uriah slept at the entrance of the palace with all his master's servants and did not go down to his house. When David was told Uriah did not go home, he asked him, haven't you just come from a distance? Why didn't you go home? Uriah said to David, the ark and Israel and Judah are staying in tents, and my master Joab and my Lord's men are camped in open fields. How could I go to my house to eat and drink and lie with my wife? As surely as you live, I will not do such a thing. It's really scary when your followers follow better than you. Uriah looks at David and says, wait a minute, dude, I, he has no idea this man has just slept with his wife and impregnated her. He looks at David and he says, I can't dishonor my people, right? I, I can't go out there and, and, or sleep in the palace when I know that, the, that we're out fighting in the ark, the presence of God is out on the front lines and we're out there sleeping in tents. So I'm not going to dishonor you as my king, and I'm not going to dishonor God, and I'm not going to dishonor my fellow warriors. I'm going to sleep here with everybody else. And what's so interesting is that the man who should be submitting to the king is doing way more than what the king is doing. And I think sometimes when we're talking about light and darkness, that's what happens, is the further we let ourselves be drug into darkness, the more we try to cover up the darkness we've created instead of just coming clean. And coming clean automatically brings us into the light. Look at verse 12. We'll keep going through here. Then David said to him, stay here one more day, and tomorrow I will, lead, or I will send you back. 
So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and next, and David, at David's invitation, he ate and drank with him, and David made him drunk. Oh, he's such a great guy. But in the evening, Uriah went out to sleep on the mat among his master's servants, and he did not go home. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it to Uriah. In it, he wrote, put Uriah at the front line where the fighting is fiercest. Then draw, or, I'm sorry, then withdraw from him so he will be struck down and die. So while Joab had the city under siege, he put Uriah at the palace where he knew the strongest defenders were. When the men of the city came out and fought against Joab, some of the men in David's army fell. Moreover, Uriah the Hittite died. What? Desire conceived and gave birth to sin, and sin produced death. What's really sad to me about this story, more than any other, is it wasn't Uriah's sin that produced death. It was David's temptation which led to desire, which led to sin, which led to someone else's death. And I think sometimes when we look at sin and we look at light and the separation between light and darkness, we look at ourselves and we think, well, I'm only hurting me. But how do we know that what we're doing isn't also hurting someone else? How do we know that what we're battling and what we're fighting with, and I'm not saying we won't have temptation. 1 Corinthians uh, 10, 13 says that no temptation, um, well, let's just turn there because I don't know what it says. Hold on. It's something about temptation. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. No temptation has seized you. That's what it is. It says no temptation has seized you except what is common to man, and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear, but when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so you can stand up under it. We look at David and Uriah. That very first time Uriah came and said to David, no, I will not sleep in your palace, God was providing a way out. David could have confessed right then and said, dude, <laughs> I, don't know how, I, don't, I don't know if someone came to me and said, hey, I, I slept with your wife, that I'd be you know, like, oh, it's okay. Uh, but he, he, could, he could have confessed right then and said, like, I have literally sinned against you, I've sinned against God, and I have taken your wife as my own. And, and he, it was like God was giving him the way out. But because he was so engraved in sin, what happens when we're so engraved in sin is when you're in darkness, because we're talking about light and darkness, so if, this, if light is actually not here, let's say light is up here, right? And then darkness... is, is kind of over here, like this is all encompassing darkness. What happens when you get into the darkness is all you want to do is try to find your way deeper into darkness, but you can't see where you're going. And so you're like, you may not, David's heart may not in that moment have thought, oh shoot, I'm just trying to murder a man. I think David's heart was, oh man, I slept with this guy's wife, so I've got to figure out how I can cover it up. And the only way I know to cover it up is to make him sleep at the gate, and then that didn't work, so I'll get him drunk, and then that didn't work, so you know what? I'm just going to kill the guy. And how many times do we find ourselves in that same place simply because we don't go after the light, but instead go after the darkness? And so I think David is a great story with Bathsheba of for us in our lives that whatever we're going through right now, we're struggling with sin or we're struggling with temptation or we're struggling with the desire. You, and, and, and I don't have to sit here and, and, and point it out. That's, that's, that's not for me. And I, like, I don't think any pastor should do that. That's just my own thing. But like, I don't have to sit here and point it out, but you know exactly what your temptations are. So my first question for you before I move on tonight is where you're at in your temptation, are you allowing it to turn to desire or are you pushing yourself back towards Christ? which is the light. And if you find yourself tonight pushing yourself down towards the desire, which will lead to sin, which will lead to death, and not towards Christ, then my challenge for you tonight when we pray in a few minutes is to pray yourself back into the light. And if you gotta get someone else to pray with you, do that. And if, if you gotta talk to someone about it, do that. But, and sometimes just confessing it to someone, right, pushes you back in the light. James 5 says to confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so you can be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective, but sometimes we try to hide it and we try to bury it deeper and we're just going deeper and now we find ourselves down here and we can't figure out how to get back up because we've just gone so deep 
into sin. And so where are you tempted? Find that place in your heart and your mind tonight and give it over to God and say, I'm going back towards the light. I'm not pushing down in towards sin and death. All right, so back to 1 John. We got through one word in that first verse, right? I love Bible study. Can I just say, like, I'm having so much fun with these. All right, so 1 John, um, so then, so um, go about down to verse 6. He says, if we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in darkness, we lie and we do not live by the truth. So we have fellowship with Christ, but we walk in darkness. We're lying. Who are we lying to? Ourselves. Thank you. Ourselves. <laughs> that wasn't a trick question. We're lying to ourselves, right? I'm saying, oh, I've, I've put myself in Christ. I've responded to his gift of salvation. I'm going to surrender my life to him. I'm going to follow him. But I'm going to still dabble over here in the darkness. I preached about that a few weeks ago, right? Like, I'm going to dabble because it's okay if I just dabble. Just put my foot in the water, right? I'm not going to drown if I just put my foot in the water. But what happens when I put my foot in the water is I'm responding to my temptation, leading it to desire. And before I know it, I'm, my, i got a couple feet. Now I'm knee deep. And then that undertow comes and grabs me, and I'm completely drowning in the same water that I thought would just be okay to just put my feet into. And so verse 6, he goes on, and he says, if you're in that place, then you're not living by the truth. Now, I told you last week, studying 1 John is harsh. Like, it's going to be harsh. This is not going to be um, some of those verses where you leave here like, woohoo, you know, like, Okay, so anyways, like I've been studying First John with a guy that I've uh, been mentoring this semester, and I, as I'm studying, I told him I need to just start teaching this stuff because it is like pulling junk up out of me because I'm seeing, wow, if I claim to be a pastor <laughs> and if I claim to have the light of Christ in me, but I'm giving the enemy a foothold in my life, then he says that if there's darkness in me, then I don't even know the truth. So our question then is, what is the truth. Look at John 18. I've been preparing for Good Friday service this week, and I was in John today reading through and studying, and uh, I thought of this verse as I was preparing for tonight. John 18, look at verse uh, 37 through 40. This is Jesus before Pilate, and Pilate asks Jesus the same question. Verse 37, this is Pilate talking. He says, you are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, you are right to say that I am a king. In fact, for this reason I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth, Pilate asked. With this he went out again to the Jews and said, I find no basis for charge against him, but it is your custom for me to release to you one prisoner at the time of Passover. Do you want me to release the king of the Jews? They said back, no, not him, give us Barabbas. Now Barabbas had taken part in a rebellion. So Barabbas was a guy who didn't know the truth, but because they were so afraid of the truth, they didn't want Jesus to live. And Pilate looks at Jesus and says, what is the truth? And Jesus doesn't even answer him, which I find fascinating. Why he doesn't answer, I don't know, because I think it'd make easier for the rest of us to, when people say, what is it, you know, or why didn't Jesus defend himself? It's because Jesus knew that God was his defense and he knew that his life would speak for him. But as I was reading that today, I thought, well, then what? Jesus does talk about truth, so what is truth? So go over to John 14. We're almost done and we're going to pray. John 14. And look at verse 5 in John 14. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where we're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do not, or, I'm sorry, from now on, you, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father that that will be enough for us. Philip's always asking questions. Jesus said, don't you know me, Philip, even after I have been among you for such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen my Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you are not just my own. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am the Father and the Father is in me, and or at least believe 
on the evidence of the miracles themselves. I tell you the truth. Anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Son may bring glory to my Father. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. So what is the truth? It's the gospel. The truth is Christ coming into the world, giving himself up for us and giving us access to his Father which is the whole reason he had to come into the world anyways, because our sin had separated us from the Father. When you look at David's life and you continue to go on and study his life and what happened after he killed Uriah to keep the wife for himself, not only did Uriah die, but the baby that Bathsheba was pregnant with also died. And in Psalm 51 is David's repentance prayer where he says, like, have mercy on me, O God. And he begins to cry out and is like, God, I'm so sorry for the things that I've done. But Psalm 51 would never have even had to been there had he just lived in the light and known the truth, which he knew, right? He did not know it. He had a relationship with God. He's a man after God's own heart. But instead he gave into temptation and desire, which led to sin and to death. So as we wrap this up tonight to get ready to pray, couple things you can write down if you're writing notes tonight. First thing is that we must believe that Jesus is who he says he is, the way, the truth, and the life. If we want to live in the light and not in the darkness, which is temptation, desire, sin, and death, then we have to believe that Jesus is who he says he is because we're not going to get it on our own. We're not going to find the light on our own. He is the light. We are not the light. And as he becomes brighter and greater to us, then our desire for him becomes greater. And then we're not like what John is saying, living in light and in darkness. We're actually living in the light of Christ. So we have to believe that he is who he says he is. The second one is that our desire for darkness will always win against the light if it's on our own strength and with our own wisdom. Our desire for darkness will always win. I totally believe that the light of Christ wins when he's at work in us. But when we give in to temptation and desire and we live in the place of sin and death and we're living in darkness, darkness can have no place with light. That's crazy. Has no fellowship with light. So when we're down here trying to figure out in the darkness how to make ourselves make it better and we end up killing somebody, right? We're in the darkness. Then that darkness is always going to win if in the darkness we're trying to find the light within ourselves. If in the darkness we're trying to say, I got this, I'm good enough, I'll have enough, I'll figure it out. If we're trying to figure it out on our own, we can only find the light through Christ. And so if you're at a place right now where you feel like you're struggling in a whole lot of darkness or you've given in a lot of temptation or you have desire for sin or you're in the place of sin or you're like, shoot, I'm already dead. I, I, I I think I already died. Well, here's the beautiful thing about grace. Like, that's the most beautiful thing about Jesus. It doesn't, it, it doesn't matter because all you have to do is say, God, I'm so sorry. And he says that he'll wash you whiter than snow. He says that as far as the east is from the west, to remember your sins no more. He takes them on himself. But if you're down here and you're not surrendering it to him and you're going, I don't know why I can't get out, maybe it's because you're actually not surrendering it back to Christ, who is the light. You're trying to make your own light in the darkness or use your own wisdom. James 1.5 says, if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault. If you're trying to figure it out on your own wisdom and you're stuck, it's because it's your own wisdom. But with his wisdom, you can get back out. The last one to write down is the light of Christ always dispels the darkness. And so my challenge for us tonight as we start praying is that we stop dabbling in darkness so that we can step into the light. I know that's not like beautiful. So I was studying that like the last hour even. I'm like, that's harsh. It's not, it's not pretty to say that if I have darkness, then I can't have light. Am I saying that as Christians and people that follow Christ, that if we have sin in our life, we don't have God? No, I'm not saying that. Am I saying that if you're struggling in an area, God's just writing you off? No, absolutely not. What I'm saying is this is for our own good. And what God is saying is, look, if you're down here trying to figure it out on your own, just surrender to me. 
and I'll pull you back out, and I'll forgive you, and I'll set you free. But you're going to keep spinning around down here, and I died for that. That's cool. Like, my blood covers it. You're good. You can still go to heaven. Like, life's, you know, life can still go on, but you're probably going to be miserable. You probably will. You'll probably be at a place where you're just stuck over and over in the same rut, going around the same mountain over and over. But if you would just surrender to me and step back into my presence and into my light, then you will truly know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And what is the truth? Christ. He's the way, the truth, and the life. So my challenge for us on these three verses is to stop dabbling in darkness and step into the light. So for the rest of the night, um, I think that's our prayer. And I don't know, like I said, for each of your lives. I also want to encourage us tonight to pray uh, for the church, to pray for this Sunday, Easter. Uh, this past Sunday was the biggest Sunday we've had since I've been here, actually, um, and it was awesome. And this coming Sunday will probably, my guess is even be bigger because it's Easter. And we've got Thursday night service, and we've got Friday night service, and we've got two on Sunday, and so much is happening. Um, and at midday prayer today, I just was up in the balcony just praying for every person that comes in here because I don't want to plan Easter festivities for the sake of Easter festivities. That's stupid. I want people's lives to come in here and be impacted and changed. So I would ask tonight that, that you make that part of your prayer as well. But on a personal note, as you're praying for yourself, that's my challenge to you, is where are you seeing temptation and desire? Or maybe it's sin for you, or maybe it's already the dead thing in your life, and you just got to thank God that he's cut it off. But where is that? And seek God in your pray, prayer time tonight and say, God, let me step back into the light of Christ so that I can live the life that you've created me to live. So I'll pray for us, and then we will sign off online, and um, we can spend the next half hour praying here, all right? God, thank you for your word, and thank you for the light. Lord, even as um, these spotlights are blinding my eyes, I'm just reminded that your light drowns out darkness, God. And Lord, when we try to get in, when we're in the darkness ourselves and we try to get out, we get so stuck because we can't see anything, God. But the minute your light, the light of Christ shines on us, it dispels darkness and darkness has to be gone. And so tonight, God, I pray uh, over every person here, Lord, that as we continue praying tonight and continue seeking you, I pray that if there's darkness in any of our lives, that your light would just turn on like these spotlights, God, that they would drown out the darkness around us, that we wouldn't keep your light away and we wouldn't say, I can't dwell with you and I, I can't find you, God, because I'm, I'm more happy down here in the dumps and in the darkness. But I pray tonight that we would let you turn on the light of Christ in our lives so that it can dispel the darkness, so that we can be people who live outside of sin, God, knowing that we will always deal with temptation, we'll always deal with desire, we'll always have sin issues we're working through in our life, but not to live in a place of habitual sin, but to live in a place under grace and under your love and under your light where we can flourish in the life that you've called us to be. I pray that you'd help us to be people who seek after Christ with all of our hearts so that we can live in your light, so we can be your light, and that your light can shine to the world around us. And I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's pray.